Alrighty, fantastic. We'll start off everyone. We'll welcome, welcome. Um, thanks so much for coming along on this Drury Amsterdam afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm Claire. I work in the university programs team. Um, I'm joined here with Felix and Sandil today. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting us to, to have a chat with you. Um, we have plenty of uh, different things lined up for you today, um, both technical and, and non-technical, just to, to have a bit of variation. Um, and then also uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. So we'll be with you for about the next 40-ish minutes um, and yeah, go from there. Um, so as I mentioned, these are the three people that you've got here. I'll quickly get Sandil and Felix to say a quick hello. Hi there, everyone. Hey, everybody. Fantastic. Um, so they will introduce themselves in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, I have been at Uber now for a little bit less than three years. Um, I'm originally from Australia. That's why I sound like this. Um, we are all, as you can see, currently working from home. So in terms of that landscape, um, we've had a bit of a sort of a hybrid model in the last sort of six months. Um, but unfortunately, our, our office is closed at the moment in the, in the past month-ish. Um, so it's been, yeah, really, really fantastic to uh, to work out how to work from home and how to study from home and do all these different things. Um, so it's so great that, that we can join you guys in your bedrooms, lounge rooms, wherever you might be today. Um, excellent. So in terms of the sorts of things that we're chatting about, um, a bit to do with Power Platform that I will cover, um, then Felix will have a go uh, and, and talk specifically about what it means in terms of tech at Uber. Um, then we'll hear from an engineer, that is Sen Deal. Um, then a re real quick part about people and culture, so you'll not just hear about the what we do, but actually how we do it and what the what the work life is like. Um, and then also a Q&A at the end there. Um, we have everything happening in the chat um, and yeah we'll go from there so in terms of uh, a couple of a quick quick questions for you guys and and feel free to use the chat um, in terms of how many people so this is my first question how many people do you think um, are in the tech team so working in engineering product design globally at uber right now um, is it a hundred? Is it two hundred? How many people do you think there are globally? Um, would love to hear what your thoughts are. There's no wrong question, uh, no wrong answers. Um, just throw it in the around five thousand, a little bit less than five thousand. Twenty, just twenty. Excellent. Um, Seven hundred, um, around four thousand. Okay, some people have done their homework. I'm really, really impressed. Well done. Um, so uh, it is uh, approximately four thousand. So yeah, that three point five to four thousand, um, depending on on which areas that we we have. Um, and then using the thumbs up button, if uh, anyone can can find it as well. Um, uh, thumbs up if you've ordered food in the last six months, uh, or so. Yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up. Excellent, Kendrick, hopefully you ordered something delicious. Um, so that is also another huge part of our business that, that we look at and that we uh, ensure that that's working on a daily basis. Um, and then my last question for you guys is how many accumulated trips do you think Uber has done uh, globally since, since the start of Uber, since around 2008? Um, Four trillion, not quite up to the trillion mark, but we're getting there. <laughs> Anyone else? Feel free to throw in any any numbers. 100 million, 900 billion, 5.2 bin, which I think it's billion. Fantastic. So there's 700, 800 million, 2 billion. Okay, we've got a got a pretty wide aspects of, of each each end. Um, so it's approximately 200, uh, 200. It's approximately 20 billion uh, trips so far. So that is across rides that's cross eats freight um and all our different services there so um that's a few few quick questions for you keep those in mind as we go through um so in terms of, of what we look at we do ignite opportunity by setting the world in motion now as i mentioned this could be the world in motion in terms of a sandwich or it could be for you to get to the airport so lots of different areas of things in terms of how it started, um, back in 2008, our, our founders uh, were in, uh, in Paris and uh, just simply couldn't get a 
get a get a get a taxi sorry um and this sort of really came about with the idea of pushing push a button and get a ride um you can see on the left hand side of the screen here what our sort of very old school app looked like it literally had one button um and some little 2t cars there um and then we very much grew so by the start of 2020 we were at around 17 billion trips and then have increased from there um, and we are servicing 10,000 cities globally so amsterdam being one of them um, yeah so then in terms of what we're looking for in the future um, this is incredibly vital to not only just rest on our laurels and understand what the current business uh business practices are but have a look at what's next um so you can see here a couple of different aspects such as atg so advanced technology group so self-driving cars they are based uh, and the, the research departments are all based in the us so in pittsburgh mainly um then we have to the right top of your screen we have uber freight um that is within uh, the us at the moment uh, we did used to have it in europe but we've just recently about a month ago sold that one to sender um so some some really interesting um ideas going on there in terms of what the future of, of freight mobility is um, and then of course, Uber Air, so flying cars. Um, it is uh, one of our up and coming um, areas. We're hoping to pilot flights, <laughs> little pun there, um, in 2023 um, with three cities, um, including Melbourne, which is, is my hometown. So really, really exciting to, to hear about that and see that. Um, it's really hard for me to be able to say, here's exactly what we're, we're up to in these sorts of areas because it does change so, so often. Um, but I've got a quick video to show you just in terms of what we're sort of looking like and, and what, fingers crossed, uh, the future mobility will be. So I'll play that one. And then uh, after that, I'll throw it across to Felix. All right, thanks for that, Claire. Hi, everyone. I am Seyus van Dorn. I'll be talking a bit about tech at Uber. Um, so don't expect any super technical deep dives here, but it's more going to be sort of a high-level view of, sort of the engineering teams in Amsterdam and Uber as a whole, and just uh, sort of high-level things that they work on. A little bit about myself. Uh, so I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in computer science from Theo Delft. I uh, did a bit in the middle there, I studied in Singapore, which also incidentally why I took my first Uber trip, I think in 2015, which is where I totally fell in love with, with the product I now get to work on uh, on a daily basis. Um, at the start of that degree, I, I, I was very much shifting towards to software engineering things like you. Uh, but while I was in Singapore, I pivoted to more data related stuff. I did some ML work. I then went on to do some AI research at a uh, at with the Volksbank, which is a Dutch, Dutch bank. Um, after graduating in 2018, I went straight to Uber, or I started January 2019. Uh, now I work as a product analyst, uh, which is basically in short, looking at data to identify how our products do and look for opportunities to develop new products. And I do that for our payments team. I think if we go to 
So yeah, the, the one thing is that obviously I work in the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of my friends always ask me, so oh, it's like why is Uber has such a big office in the Netherlands and like do you only work on, on stuff in the Netherlands? Uh, tech at Uber is a very global function. So you get to call with people all over the world each and every day. Um, so as you can see, we have offices in India, Bulgaria, Lithuania, Denmark, Netherlands, France. I think we're actually opening up one in Ireland, which is like so new that we didn't even get time. I just found it out like just for a presentation. Uh, Brazil one's also pretty new. And then uh, actually quite a few in the US, even in some of these cities, we have multiple offices. So it's very funny that when I have a lot of coworkers in San Francisco and Palo Alto who don't actually think that they're in the same building and say, oh, we have like five offices in the same street. It's uh, just the scale is, is, is quite mind boggling uh, at times. Um, even more so, I think beyond the scale though, the Amsterdam team is quite, is quite tight because um, as you can see, we had about 170 engineers this year. Um, I think we have about three teams. This is a picture from our, I think our team outing to the beach in the summer 2019 when it was still responsible to stand so close to each other. Um, so I think the team is, is a pretty, I think a lot of these people have actually joined pretty recently, even though our site was found in 2014. I think most of these people have actually joined in the last three years or so. Um, so it's been, uh, and other than that, we're a very site where even though there's multiple teams, we just quite a lot of interaction between the teams, a lot of knowledge sharing, uh, tech talks, uh, fun events, so both sort of formal and informal contact. Uh, so all in all, it's, you know, it feels like a very co nice, cozy site to work on. Another question I get a lot from all of my friends is like, hey, you just work on an app, right? An app on a smartphone. I, I, I tried out myself. It should be a few hours of work, and you, maybe 10, 20 engineers. That should be it, right? And then you get to explain them just how complex our business is. I always like the, the iceberg analogy or just how big it is. Uh, so generally you start explaining, right? We have multiple apps, multiple lines of business. So we already see here, um, in this slide, we see the rider app, uh, which is where people order trips. Then we have the driver app, which is what people use to actually earn on the platform Then the eats app. Um, and then sort of like we even see the freight app where uh, it's pretty cool. You can order, just manage your freight stuff in an app. And then comes all, all the core platform stuff, sort of like money, sort of like payments processing. Uh, fraud checks, uh, safety and compliance, uh, maps. And that's where you get these in imm immense code bases of almost 100 million lines of code. You do 3K microservices and the, the, the 1K daily releases. That's just something where I think my limited software engineering experience is just where you maybe did like one release every two, three days and then about 1,000 in a day. That's, uh, it's pretty impressive. And all of that code has to work in 69 countries uh, across the world. So especially if you're in, like in the networking part, um, that can be a quite an interesting challenge. And one of the sort of true challenges I've come to appreciate there quite recently is the fact that not all of the, these things aren't just virtual. Like what we do is, is like has like you push a button and something happens in the real world. And even also when as an engineer you make mistakes that has very real world consequences. Uh, for instance, in my team payments, uh, you've had, we've had like very sort of innocuous bugs where a string and, a, and a, an integer got flipped and that meant thousands of people didn't get paid on time. And those are, I don't know, kind of frustrating, frustrating things, things to, to see. Um, or I think I came across an incident the other day where seconds of lag would lead to, I don't know, fraudsters actually stealing whole, a whole bunch of like trying to steal a whole bunch of money. And that's sort of the, the engineering challenges that you only see at sort of the scale that we operate on. I think, next slide. So to give you an idea of the Amsterdam side specifically, um, to just give you the top three are sort of the product areas is where like the engineers in our, on our teams kind of work on. And then the bottom three are sort of, are embedded within those top three, but they are like the non-engineering functions uh, that, that you also get to work with because my guess is that my understanding of your program is it's very focused on engineering, on sort of software engineering. Uh, but at Uber, the tech team is considered to be engineering plus product plus UX plus data. Uh, so to give you an idea, the money is the biggest team uh, on uh, in the Amsterdam side. And in short, we just try to enable anyone anywhere to pay for Uber. So that means uh, supporting different payment methods, making sure we're compliant with uh, all kinds of payment and banking regulations across countries, 
Um, and also a uh, big product for us is making, uh, one that I've worked on recently or this year mostly, is making sure that people can get paid within 20 seconds of finishing their trip, which is actually quite a big product. Um, so imagine we have, I think we can now to about 70% of our, our drivers across the world, we can get them paid within 30 seconds of them actually finishing the trip, which is quite unmatched by any bank in the world, uh, which is super duper exciting. Um, then on to the other team, uh, ad tech. So they make sure that our ad spends are optimized and automated and that more people get to sort of uh, become aware of Uber and that they get, I think if you ever get to receive promos or coupons, it's a very high chance that this team has, um, has a part in that. And then the driver team, which is sort of deceiving name because it also deals with couriers. Basically, it deals with everyone who earns money on, on the Uber platform and uses Uber to, 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 to earn money. Um, one big focus for them is to make sure that the, it's very clear to them how their earnings are, came to be uh, because obviously we're doing business with them and that trust is a massive component in that. And if they don't trust like the money that they're actually being paid out, um, that's, that's just a discussion you don't want to have. Uh, I think an interesting sub area that the Amsterdam team works on is also called driver access, which is something I had never thought of, but we actually have a lot of um, careers and drivers in parts of the world where a large part of them are actually illiterate. So they try to use the app, but they actually can't read. And how do you engineer something that even though they can't read, um, it's still easy to use and clear to sort of use. Uh, it's very uh, niche, but an entertaining engineering challenge. Um, and then to give you an idea of product or product management, a uh, big key for them is to make sure that the right things get built and also very actively prioritize not what not to build as the Uber team is very big, lots of interesting ideas. And, you know, when you're hacking away the project uh, and you just want to build, you just think of features all the time. It's like, oh, let's build this. Um, once you get to the tight timelines and, and sort of scale we, we, we are at, uh, you also have someone sort of, actively say no to, to these things and make sure that uh, we stick to the roadmap and make sure that we are building things that our customers want and need. Um, then UX and design, um, it's very, the Amsterdam studio, lots of great people there. Um, sort of, they try to make sure that the user experience is clear, um, that it's localized properly as well. Um, sort of, that's also a thing that what a user in the Netherlands wants to see is totally different from some, what someone in India would want, want to see or uh, Japan, um, I think we have, I think Japan is a very specific example where we had last sort of where we had figured out that the designs were a bit rushed, and it actually turned out that our Japan drivers absolutely hated it, and I think that 80 or 90 percent of, of people actually had trouble with it until a designer came in and sort of localized it better or made it better suited to Japanese uh, trends, and that's I don't know underappreciated. If if you come from pure engineering background like me, you have to see this in practice just to see how valuable it is. And then my own team data, um, yeah, I'd sort, I just look at all, all sorts of data from logs to support tickets to do sort of external market research uh, to look at what should we be building or what should we change on our existing products um, or what, should, what products should we deprioritize. And uh, I think I can keep talking about that one forever, but not, not the point of today. Um, I think in case you're interested in teams outside of the Amsterdam site in uh, Denmark or who specifically, we have a core infra team uh, that makes, I think they do a lot of our sort of continuous integration software or deployment software, as, correct me if I'm wrong, Sendel. Uh, in Lithuania, we have site reliability to make sure that everything keeps running uh, because we have very, very strict uh, uptime needs and, and reliability. And whenever something goes wrong, we need rapid response and people highly focused on that area. And then in Bulgaria, um, sort of it says backend financial systems, their, their niche very much is tax and invoicing, which is very interesting to see how taxes are sort of computed differently across countries and they need to be done absolutely right on every bill, especially for business customers, which is, is quite an interesting challenge that they face. I think the one um, that you might be interested in, very niche one is Paris, where it's our European ATG office. I don't think we have any internship openings there, but it's it's good to know about that one in case you're interested in, in uh, more hardcore ML research. I think on that, I'll be giving over to Sendel for the meat of this presentation. And uh, I hope you guys enjoy that. Hey everybody. Thanks, Felix. Thanks for the handover. Uh, it's great to see you all today. 
Uh, so a little bit about me, I'm Sandil. Next slide, please. Yeah, so I graduated and started my job at a consultancy and started working for Singapore Airlines around 2010-ish. Uh, in 2013, I moved to you know uh, Singapore during this period, like I started developing application, uh, improving infrastructure, team management, project management, end-to-end -end development, things like that. After that, uh, I moved to Netherlands around 2017. <laughs> Uh, here I started my open source journey and uh, and then I also wrote my first book during this time and I travel almost all of Europe uh, on the pretext of conference talks and things like that. Uh, it was a very exciting phase where I started traveling a lot and after that uh, in 2019 I joined Uber. Uh, it, it was a completely different place for me and by the beginning of this year I also bought a house and rolled out my first application in Uber and that was a huge success for me. Yeah, next slide please. So uh, why did I join Uber? That the base, main reason why I joined Uber is like being an Uber, you can bring an impact to millions of people. Uh, and that kind of motivated me uh, to join this company. Along with that impact, uh, the last year was like, it's not only about you know, delivering code and things like that. There were like a lot of heated discussion around code reviews, a lot of challenges, opportunities, and a lot of guidance and everything that you can expect inside inside an Uber size company. And here you have a very good vibrant culture and the team is really awesome. That helps you, guides you, and you can also take part in that. And this is a region where you can actually evolve, right? So the next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, uh, so this was my first application, valid.uber.com. Uh, so there are two types of users uh, that are using Uber at a high level. Like one is the earner, the other one is spender. The owner is someone who earns money from Uber and the spender is someone like us who spends money on Uber and then buy things. Uh, but traditionally as a company, we have the single uh, user pay system. So if you take an Uber app, for example, it's exclusively catered for a spender. And if you take uh, a driver app, it's exclusively catered for an owner, right? And when I started this journey, valid.uber.com was like, it's, 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 some, it's a product that kind of like puts everything, unifies everything, both the users and deliver it to the application. It has its own level of complexities, but uh, it was my first project also inside Uber. And uh, yeah, this, this unique project is actually completely driven by the engineers inside the company. And right now we have like around 900 million unique users who are using this application and they are also cashing out millions of uh, dollars every week. And that is a massive application, massive thing that you can see. So I came in for an impact. I could deliver an impact within six to eight months and deliver an application and roll it out globally. That was something I really enjoyed being in this company. Next slide, please. So let's explore uh, what kind of opportunities or what kind of things that you can expect inside and over. Uh, we of course have more than 3K microservices and there is a design team too inside the Uber there are like, you can generate applications that can be Android and uh, iOS. You can do web development inside Uber and you can also join data. So this is from data team. So you can also join data inside Uber and there are many more things. So you have an opportunity where you cannot, you need not confine yourself at one particular area of tech development, but you can gradually move to other areas and you can explore those opportunities and learn a lot from those opportunities. Next slide, please. So how things work inside Uber? So we, of course, uh, split into multiple teams and each team comes under different organization and those are the things that happens in all the company. But as an engineer, when you start developing a product, the very first thing that you're gonna do is like write an EID. EID is nothing but uh, engineering requirement document. Uh, so it's kind of a requirement analysis document where you put down what and how you're gonna generate and what are the things that you wanna write inside the application. Once you write an EID, you send it to entire company. So everybody inside Uber, how can take a look at those ERD and then they can comment on it. They can say like, what are the things happening? Whether it's right or wrong and things like that. So entire company looks the entire ERD. Next click, please. Yeah, uh, and then approves it. Once it is approved, the entire thing is you're gonna generate the code and you're gonna generate the application. So there is this box, which is your backend application, right? Uh, what is this? For, uh, can you go back two slides? Can you go back two? Yeah, so at the box, the blue one. So what is the programming language that comes to your mind when you see this box? Anybody? Any guesses? Python, Rust, C++, Go, PHP, 
Okay. This is Python. The person who said Python is correct. The next one. What's this? By the way, guys, I have absolutely no idea. So whatever you think is great. <laughs> Any guess on this language? Blue box. Oh, wow, that's nice. No, this is actually go. The next one. No, not JavaScript. No. The final, okay, that is Java. And the next one is Node.js. So the teams that are involved over here is infrastructure and uh, engineering. So they are the people who takes care of like loading this application, deploying this, and then maintaining this entire thing. And once you have done developed your application, this can be a backend system. So after that, you go ahead. And, yeah, you will go ahead and create the product that is visible for the external world. So this gives a perspective of your application of your company to the external world, right? So the teams involved here is design and engineering who put up a prototype, who put up a new user interface and things like that. So once you create this entire thing, once you deploy this, and then the next one. Yeah, and then uh, you collect uh, data from how the users are using application. You find out what are the things that is happening inside your application. Is there any bugs? If there is something that is difficult for users, if there is something that is not working as you expected. You collect those events, you collect those information, and this is where data and engineering team comes into picture where uh, you kind of sit together and decide like what is going wrong with your application, what are the things that you could perfect, what are the things that you can enhance further. Once you have this data, once you have this events, the very next step is like you go and uh, create an ERD, which would be a next application where you start building your next application or enhanced version of the product. Once you have done this entire thing, this is a loop that happens again and again until you perfect your product. Sometimes when we're doing this entire thing, we could build a product that is completely different from what we are. Like we are a you know, transport kind of company and we are going to build something for our infrastructure. Those are the times what we do is like once we build those entire product, we kind of open source that entire application to the external world so everybody can use it. Next one, please. Yeah, so that is the other one. So once you create an application that is not critical to your line of business, we kind of open source it to the external world where people can use that and they can enjoy using that application. Next slide, please. So that is what Uber as a whole, how this, how it works inside Uber. So let's go for a small, you know, I hear from Mick that you all are like doing your courses on coding. So, and your main focus area is C++. So I have a good example in C++, which is an interesting bug fix that we have done. So let's see uh, how many of you captures this thing. So we have the service A. Uh, the service A actually handles around thousand records per second and it's deployed once in every two weeks. And then you have the service B. Next click, please. Yeah, you have the service B, which is 10 times more. It has 10K records per second, and it also has a uh, deploy, but it is done once in every four weeks, that has two a month. Next slide, please. So both the services are kind of using this code. Uh, so this code is running inside one service. Uh, the code, what it does is like, it's very simple. It's a C++ code. Uh, it is used for some cryptographic stuff. So that is the reason like you have this environment object and then you have this character array. So once you send these two things to get array function, uh, it takes a length of the character array and then it creates a new buffer. And once it creates, it goes to the environment and gets a value of the length that is given to you and then puts that inside and then returns the buffer. Uh, so the line number three or four environment get array, actually what, it's a meet of the function where it takes uh, CA as an input, and then it puts the value inside buffer, and then it returns a buffer. So this is what is happening. It returns an unsigned character error. That's it. Cool. And then we saw this memory usage for that entire application usage. So as you can see here, uh, the red ones are the higher peak ones, and the uh, blue ones are the minor small ones. Uh, so blue ones are for service A, and red ones are for service B. So as you can see here, uh, Usually all these services, the memory usage is like we have a buffer. If it reaches 100%, we have like a little bit more buffer such that the crashes are not happening at times. But we see a slight increase. Uh, next, quick, please. Uh, 
So we see a nice, uh, we see that max capacity, but it's slightly going away. It, it's not a big problem for us, but as an engineer, you want to fix that thing, right? And the next slide, please. So what is the problem here? Someone said memory leak, but what, someone said leak or memory leak. What is the leak that you're mentioning here? Um, I think it was Harm. Harm, are you yeah. able to, to chat? Or yeah, maybe get array checks if our first now. No, not really. Get array is fine. You lock it with the yeah, that's it. Han gets it correct. So yeah. So yeah, so that's cool. So the uh, we allocate the buffer and then we don't remove that entirely from it. So the memory is reserved there and it times it takes time for it, it is not getting released at all, and you have a problem. So that's why you are seeing a memory peaks there. The next one. Next slide, next week. So we spent a lot of time thinking what is gonna happen and what are the things that we can fix this entire way. And it, it was like not very obvious when you see it, especially if it's a million lines of code, right? Next one. So we fixed it something like this. Uh, we created a string. String is automatically memory managed, right? So we deleted the buffer and then returned the message. That's, that's basically it. So yeah, you have those kind of exciting fixes, exciting new features, just like Violet to protect on whatever you can build, you can build it inside over. That's basically it. With that, I hand it over to Claire. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sandil. Uh, I'm glad you were explaining that, not me. Um, so really quickly, guys, we've got a, a quick part about people and culture, what it all means, how we all do it, um, and then feel free to ask me any questions. So globally, and of course, uh, Felix and Sandil to ask any questions for you guys as well. Um, so globally, we have approximately uh, 20,000 uh, full-time employees. So that's not uh, including anyone uh, like a driver or a courier. Um, that's just purely um, our, our staff that, that work on these sorts of problems. Um, majority of them are an operations uh, sort of profile. Um, so apart from our approximately 4,000 uh, tech team, we have a lot of operations. Operations in a really, really quick word is anything to do with supply and demand of the platform. So some of those roles can be quite technical in terms of marketplace sorts of positions. So working a lot with SQL and, and Python in terms of those roles, um, then others can be more to do with promotions, marketing, all those different areas. So it really is a completely and utterly uh, sort of wide in terms of all the different sorts of positions and the sorts of people. Um, on top of that, uh, in terms of our cultural norms, so the reason they're cultural norms and not cultural values is because we believe that we are quite a flexible and, and fungible kind of company. And so we're making sure that our norms may and can change over time. Um, one thing that I think is really, really valid um, within, within our cultural norms is particularly that we do celebrate those differences. So you're, you've heard from three different people today from three different countries who can speak all sorts of different languages. Uh, we're a really good representation of just how many different nationalities. Um, in, uh, in, in the Amsterdam office specifically, I think we're approximately around 60 different nationalities. Um, and, and growing. So it, it is really, really fun in terms of getting to know all the different cultures um, and understandings and, and just to have different different ways of working. Um, one thing that Dara, our CEO, really, really champions is that we uh, do the right thing, period. So just trying to ensure that we're as transparent as possible in all sorts of things that we do um, and to try and ensure that our team goes and, and works towards the future. We're very, very um, cognizant in the fact that we've come a long way from 2008. Think about how you used to try and get from A to B when, uh, you know, particularly when traveling and things like that. But we still have a very, very long way to go in terms of that. So, so many different areas. So as I was explaining for celebrating differences, we do have employee resource groups. So these are groups for the people by the people, um, particularly Lady Eng and Women at Uber is one of our really, really core cool groups um, and our largest uh, globally. So lots of different resources, events, um, initiatives, pay parity was a major one just to ensure that we are um, we are coming across and uh, in pretty much investing in terms of our futures.
So one thing that I'm in charge of, um, apart from lots of other things, is our Amsterdam internship programs. Um, we are currently recruiting for interns uh, to start in January and also in July of 2021. Um, in terms of the sorts of roles um, that you can expect within this um, is very much uh, being embedded in a team, solving problems on a daily basis um, with, uh, with both virtual and hybrid sort of in-person um, set up at the moment. Um, we do pay our interns. This is incredibly important. So an intern uh, in Amsterdam gets paid approximately 3,000 euros per month. Uh, and then you also get uh, credits to spend in the app as well. So a bunch of really, really fantastic opportunities there. Um, I have sent across the, the link specifically to Victoria, um, who's heading up your partnerships area at Codam, but also more than happy to connect with, with any of you um, in terms of uh, yeah, getting an internship into the future and getting some real um, hands-on experience, um, which is always really great. Um, so in terms of, of how that all works, you know, we always have this question, how do I actually get a role into the future? Um, so in terms of uh, that, you apply online, um, you have a talk with someone like myself, you then could do a coding challenge. Um, so that is using whatever lang coding language of choice. Um, it goes, we have, we give approximately three hours to complete it, um, but it doesn't take usually that long. Um, then you have a team interview, so that's three separate interviews. Um, and then we give you feedback from your interviews and hopefully uh, give you an offer. So that is it in a nutshell. Um, now I saw we've got uh, some questions and things like that from Tice. Um, in terms of some different things there, but feel free to ask any questions. I'm not sure, I think it's slightly technical, I'm not exactly sure, um, but feel free to ask myself, Sandil or Felix any questions, either on chat, but we would also love to hear your voices. So feel free to, um, to, to pipe up and we can uh, answer any of your questions there. Um, so yeah, go for it. No questions too big or too small. Can I go back to the previous slide? Of course I can. Here you go. <laughs> no worries at all, Erin. I'm glad you're, you're interested in, in these things. The self-driving car, is this going to be pluggable like comma.ai or is this show, chauffeurless? Um, so what I will start out by saying is none of us actually unfortunately work in the ATG department, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, Felix or Sandil, do you have any ideas on, on ATG and, and driverless cars for this question? I think I think there's two two points to this. One is like from a purely technical perspective, what's what's going to be possible? And the second mm -hmm. one is going to be a compliance thing. Yeah. Uh, because I think on the on, I think in the questions already like what do laws are, are they going to stipulate? Uh, I think currently uh, all everything that drives on the road has someone behind the wheel uh, I think uh, just to sit there um, and I think on the test tracks we have uh, cars that drive completely without someone yeah. um, so they can drive totally without a person in there uh, but how that will turn out into a product uh, we're gonna also going to have to see what people are, are going to want as well is maybe uh, that's a totally unexplored area like the, the pure product experience there. Yeah, definitely, definitely plus one on that. Um, it is quite a, a new and interesting environment, just like a lot of what Uber has done in the past. There's simply not that much uh, clarity in terms of laws, regulations, and, and what, what it looks like going forward. Um, as, as I mentioned in the, in the presentation, it is uh, mostly based, based in the US, so that's where they're currently doing all their testing. Um, but who knows what will happen in the next year or two? Um, we might see, yeah, different areas there. Um, we've got a next question. What are the main qualities that Uber is looking for from an intern? Um, Felix or Sandil, do you want to talk about some of the qualities that we're looking for at Uber altogether? As well as an intern? Yeah, <laughs> you want to go first? Want to go first? Yeah, All right, go. I can go first. I think the, the one thing I've seen with interns that did well um, it's, it's going to, this is going to sound very cheesy, but curiosity is one thing <laughs> because we don't expect you to know everything. Uh, obviously come, coming into here, 
Uh, but it's your attitude is going to make a difference. Uh, at least I had a good example. We had two interns uh, last year in terms of coding ability. Um, like I think one was slightly better than the other, but the one who came in with the lower coding ability, actually when he ran into problems, proactively reached out to multiple team members, like, hey, how can I do this next time? Uh, how should I do this? Uh, like, like from a theoretical point of view, how can I write better code? And he was just asking questions all the time. And at the end of the internship, he's the one, I think he's coming back now. And the other one, um, like the conclusion was like, you're, like, you're super smart, um, but you just didn't show that much interest in, in figuring out and learning from the people that you work with who have 15, 20 years of experience in the industry and who can teach you a lot more. Um, other than that, I think ownership is an important one um, because there is this sort of an attitude that I've heard in the past, oh, I'm an engineer, so I just stick to the technical parts. Um, if you have ideas about how the product sh uh, should be or how it affects uh, our earners or spenders, um, they just raise the point. Like, you, it's not like the PM, like a PM or a business analyst or someone makes a choice and you just have to go build it. Uh, you are part of the decision loop, and and make use of that because it's you. You might you offer a perspective uh, that they might not be able to see because you're so in the weeds of how the product is actually going to work. Um, so that's two things that come, come to mind for me. Yeah, I think you nailed it there, Felix, like uh, curiosity and the interesting stuff. Yeah, that's, that's basically it from my side. But... Yeah, for sure. I think, uh, yeah, I, I interview software engineers every single day. I recruit across so many different areas. Um, and the, the, the main reason that I reject people is because they their motivation. They, they just want to work for, for a tech company. It's like the main question I'm always going to ask you is why would you like to work for Uber rather than another tech company? You know, what is your motivation behind it? Is it to make an impact? Is it to work with cutting edge technology? You know, what is what really interests you? And we want to know about it. Um, some some interns in the past have, have interviewed with us um, and gained, gained the role specifically because they talked about how passionate they were about um, a particular a particular video game and, and how exciting that is, you know, that, that real eagerness is definitely something that we're looking for, um, which is really, really exciting. Um, let me just quickly have a look here. What is our next one from Klee? Um, how does the training program look like for software engineers at Uber? Um, Sandil and Felix, do you want to talk about um, some of the, the, the ways that we have training? I think I think I'm sending to take this one first because it's specific to software engineers and maybe I can offer some some general perspectives uh, cool. later. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, so the training is uh, much like you will be given an uh, onboarding task or something like that where we, we will explain how the entire architecture is and we can choose like which are the things that you're most interested in. For example, if you if you're going starting for a front end application, there might be a couple of areas where you might be specifically interested in how the layout of things work, or you might be interested in doing the performance of the application, or just like testing the application and then increasing the code coverage and things like that. So you can pick your favorite area and then you can explore in that area further. So there will be like smaller onboarding tasks. And people will sit next to you and people will help you out if, if you're stuck at some places. If you're asking questions, there will be always someone who will come and uh, answer those questions for you. But at the next stage is like once the first thing is like smaller tasks and then gradually we go into a small size project. It will be not huge, but it will be a small size project where we would like to see like your overall capability, like you're trying to do what, uh, like all the areas in, in the, with respect to that team. And it kind of differs from team to team and where you're going to place yourself. But on the at the end of the day, it will be like you'll be having stepping stones like smaller tasks and then a small project in which you can deliver and then we could find like what are the things that we value most. And that's basically it. Felix, do you want to add something here? I think yeah, that covers uh, most most of I think the most important part. I think the entry and the first few weeks, months. Uh, I think only thing that I, I work on on top of that is, uh, for instance, on my team payments. Uh, I also teach uh, engineers that start, like that was a technical part taken care of by software engineers. Uh, but then for instance, we will also give you some extra training on uh, the domain knowledge, like, hey, you will be working on payments problems. You might not have worked on that before. So here's like a few sessions, like a few hours of like, okay, what does all the jargon mean? And download that in your head. Um, I think that's a small part of, of the other one. And then beyond, I think the period that Sandal described, uh, our philosophy is very much that you learn most by doing. So it's something called the, 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 the abstract, it's something called the 70-20-10 model, 
Um, I think you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's sort of a model of learning. It's not exact science, uh, but the idea is roughly 70% of what, you, what you're going to learn here is by doing it on the job and by just getting your hands dirty. I think you've learned, I think your education is a good example of that. Just like you learn by, by doing, by, by coding it and not from a textbook or a, a boot camp, et cetera. Um, this is how you remember it best. Uh, 20% is by sort of peer learning, sharing what you do, tech talks, uh, working with the engineers, such as how Sendel described it. And then we actually have a 10% is it's from formal coursework and learning, uh, which we have lots and lots of internal libraries. Uh, we have LinkedIn learning, we have Safari, it's like the O'Reilly ones free. So you can fill your weeks with so much uh, webinars and, and learning. So I think on the learning front, you can make turn it into your own rocket ship experience if, if you like. Rocket ship. I love that. And and yeah, just um, piggybacking off of what Felix and Sendil were saying, as well as that uh, within our specific like, internships and, and when you're first starting at Uber, um, we have a really, really close mentorship program. So you will have uh, an Uber um, engineer as a mentor and also you'll have a manager as well, um, just to ensure that your goals are really um, strategic, that they're there and we'll work towards them and put a roadmap for you throughout your entire internship. So it's not just you come along and you, I don't know, fix some bugs or something. It really is, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to achieve? What do you, what do you want your impact to be um, to then hopefully uh, afterwards, either if you go back to study or into the future, if you're wanting to gain a full-time position at Uber as well. Um, majority of our software engineer interns actually go on to work at Uber. Um, around 90, 95%, which is fantastic. Um, now we have one last question that we'll tackle. And when I say will, I don't mean me, I'm going to throw it across to the others. Um, how is the development and usage of internally built tooling, programming libraries for a programming language, for example? I'll let you guys take that. Hey, I'm sending I, can, or? I can take yeah. that. So <laughs> cool. is it other than so yeah, so we have this uh, dev uh, platform team as well as Slack like, infrastructure team, which kind of uh, helps you to like set up the center thing. We are not using any of the open source project, which is the coming up question, which is, is a lot of open source. We don't have it, most of it, like uh, we don't have it for the scale of Uber. So what we did was like, we kind of like created our own products. So for example, the community plugins, like community things like Kubernetes, Istio or something that you might have seen outside world, you might not see it inside Uber. I was literally surprised when I joined the company because those kind of tools we are not using. We are having everything custom built for the scale of Uber. And that is something. And we, we have a specific team which takes care of setting up this thing. So you have this Java development platform team, uh, Go platform team, and all those platform team, which kind of focuses on enhancing the experiences of developers, how to make it better for the developers, how to make it easier, uh, how you can get your code from, the, from your IDs into the production environment much faster. And then there is an infrastructure team which kind of takes care of like how to make sure code is running perfect. You get all the events that you require for analyzing your application, how it's behaving and things like that. So it also handles those entire things together. So there are a separate set of things who, teams who are focusing mainly on this streams. And yeah, so that is what we have for maintaining the programming languages and build tooling and things like that. I think I'm just going to post a link here if you're interested, uh, because beyond what, what what's Sendil described, we have, I think there's two categories. There's stuff that we develop ourselves and then go on to open source. And then there are some popular open source technologies that we contribute a lot back to. I think one that I use on a daily basis is because I, I work in, in data analytics is PrestoDB, which is a sort of a SQL on Hadoop thing where you can process terabytes in a few seconds which originally was developed by Facebook, but because Uber uses it so intensively, we've actually contributed a lot of improvements to it. And I think a lot of people actually learn, like I think half the company uses this, even like people outside of tech, because it's such a majestic piece of engineering. It's like, just love it to bits. Um, it's gonna, if you, I think those of you on GitHub, um, there you have one. I think some specific examples are also our Uber AI team. Um, like in the development of self-driving cars, they've worked on a lot of interesting uh, problem spaces. I think of a favorite of mine is Ludwig, which is a no-code deep learning tool. It's uh, it's deb debatable, obviously, from a technology perspective, like is that actually the best thing? But if you are, I don't know, building like a web scraper and you need something really quick to actually process text that, you're, that you've uh, like put in, uh, this one gives you a deep net right out, of the right out of the box and you can actually start doing NLP 
without having to go deep weeds deep into the the, the math. Uh, so very lovable one there. Um, so I hope you can find something of your liking of, of some of the cool stuff that we actually work on in the open source space. Absolutely. And I'd definitely uh, piggyback off that and say, have a look at our eng blog. Um, there's some really, really great examples of the sorts of uh, problems that we try and solve on a daily basis. The reason I always say problems is that like we view our, our roles and our jobs as like trying to, trying to solve all the different things that come about. Um, now there are so many different areas with Uber to, to problem solve, but it is really, really exciting because there's never ever going to be a day where you don't uh, aren't come across some kind of issue or problem or something to solve, um, which makes our jobs very, very interesting on a daily basis. And um, I know it's quite cliche, but no day is ever the same. There's always something new to have a look at, to do, to learn um, and to, to sync with as well. Um, so those are all of our questions. Um, thank you so much for coming along. I know we're a little bit over time, but thank you so much. Um, we'll have this uh, recording for, for Mick um, and, and for all of, of Codem as well. But thank you so much for coming along and, and uh, by uh, coming, coming for your, your Wednesday afternoon, um, where we're all based here in Amsterdam. Feel free to connect with us on LinkedIn, all those different things. Um, but then hopefully, yeah, we'll connect in the future and, and see some of you um, in, in, in uh, Uber in, in the near future. Fingers crossed. Awesome. All righty. Thanks, guys. See you later. Right. Thanks for the enthusiasm, team. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.